When, uh, when Superman arrived on our planet, he found that uh, some combination of the factors and the variables in our environment bestowed superpowers on him, endowed him with superpowers. Um, I think that's pretty interesting. I think as we look at ourselves and we look at the factors in our environment, the context that we find ourselves in, whether it's the kind of technological tools that we have access to, um, you know, the graduate degrees that you've either completed or are pursuing, technical infrastructure, the grants that are available for us to apply for, the social network that you're a part of here. I think these factors in our environment also endow us with superpowers. The same way that coming to Earth endowed Superman with his. And in particular, I think it endows us with the most important superpower, which is opportunity. Um, I don't think we think of opportunity as a superpower, but it clearly is. Um, even if you think about being able to turn things to fire or whatever else without opportunity, you can't even use those superpowers. Right? Opportunity is the key superpower, I believe. I, I love this quote from Audrey Hepburn. No, nothing's impossible because the word itself says, I'm possible. Um, I want to posit to you, and I don't think it's disingenuous at all to say that if you're sitting in this room right now, you have the social network, you have the technical capability, you have uh, the access to grants and funding. Any person in this room could do anything that they set their mind to, full stop. Nothing's impossible to anybody in this room. Um, and yet we find ourselves um, whiling away our time publishing papers like this. This is, this is not a real paper, by the way. <laughs> and I worked hard on that abstract, so you better read it. <laughs> but when you, when you look at the kind of brain power that's available to us, you look at the kind of opportunity that we have to change the world, and we spend our time you know, trying to get our two articles a year in so that we don't, uh, you know, don't have trouble making tenure, it, it, leaves us, it, it leaves me feeling confused about the way we spend our time and the productivity um, the productivity that we are or aren't able to achieve. Back to the superhero theme. Um, when you're in a room full of people, every one of whom you believe could do anything that they set their mind to, given the context that they find themselves in, uh, it becomes a very serious question. With, you know, with great power comes great responsibility, and what, in particular, are you going to do with your superpower? What are you doing with your superpower? I think we saw a great example you know, in Ali's example, of going after these boys. Terrific thing to do, to go save people with your superpower. If you took the work that you do, if you summarized the, you know, pulled together the last five or ten articles that you published, and you were to tap the person in front of you in the line at Starbucks and say, hey, let me tell you about my work for 60 seconds. Would they feel like this? Would they scratch their head and wonder why they should care? Would they ask, was that funded with taxpayer money? <laughs> what you did? Um, or, you know, would they feel like me the day I got my Henry dog? Uh, when they heard about the work you're doing, would they be so grateful that you're going after these boys, that you are going to reach out to them, that you are going to save them? I don't know how many of you have seen this Pixar short called Jack-Jack Attack. Um, terrific. Jack-Jack is the youngest of the Incredibles and he's just coming into his powers in the movie. and uh, He's just understanding that he has superpowers and he's trying to figure out how to use them. So he does ridiculous things like sit on the ceiling and pull the you know, lid off his milk bottle and spill the milk everywhere. Just because we have superpowers doesn't mean that it's innately evident to us how we ought to use them to our best advantage or to the best advantage of those around us? How is it that we, that we can use our superpowers to be helpful? I think that's a question that we all ought to spend a lot of time asking ourselves. Um, you know, I, I have spent a lot of time bumbling around trying to figure out what it is that I'm doing and why my mom should care when I tell her about my work. A, can she understand it? B, does she see why it's meaningful and important? 
Um, I, I'm, I'm not out to save boys, I'm working on another problem, and you'll be working on a problem separate from my problem and from Allie's problem. The point isn't to try to get us all to work on the same problem. The point I hope to make is just to persuade you to find a meaningful problem and think seriously about the accountability and the stewardship that you have after you've been endowed with these superpowers. How are you going to use them? You know, the, the problem that I've kind of zeroed in on is the cost of education, access, and affordability. So everybody's seen these numbers, right, that student loan debt is over a trillion dollars now. And what is it that's special about student loan debt relative to all other debt? Say it louder. You can't get rid of it. Right? A trillion dollars of debt that nobody can get rid of. And we typically, uh, you know, we assign blame for that in the higher education context mostly to tuition, which is up, you know, like 1,100% in the last three decades. But the, the number we don't often also talk about is the line just below that, which is the fact that textbook costs are up over 800% in the last three decades. You know, for a bit of applied math, if you're a student thinking about how to use the 20-some extra dollars you have a month, here are two choices you could make. You know, one, you could purchase, you know, a month's worth of streaming access to every movie, every television show, and every song ever recorded. Or you could take that same 20-some dollars and rent one month of access to an online biology textbook. That's the math. So I'm interested in attacking this problem from the angle of open educational resources, right? Uh, we all know what educational resources are. They're things like textbooks, they're things like videos, or like syllabi, or lesson plans. But what does open mean in this context? Right? Open educational resources are educational resources that A, allow free and unfettered access. I don't have to pay to get these materials. I don't have to give away my email address. I don't have to create an account. They're just there and they're available for me to use. And in terms of the kind of copyright license that they're licensed under, I get free permission to engage in what we call the 4R activities. The 4Rs being reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. So when I have, say, a textbook that's an open textbook that has an open license on it, I have permission to ch tear chapters out, to change the order that chapters occur in, to pull out examples that don't speak to my students and put new examples in, or better yet, to assign my students to pull those examples out and write their own students that speak directly to them and to their peers, to take chapters from multiple open textbooks, put them together, and whatever it is I end up with at the end of the day, to put that back on the web for free for anybody to come and download and reuse without having to pay and without them violating copyright law because these are all copyright licensed in a way that grants these 4R permissions. So I've worked and worked and worked in this area, and I've published and published, and you know, a couple dozen articles, and a couple seven, eight million dollars worth of grants, and you know what happened at the end of all that? Crickets. Well, this is one cricket. Multiple crickets. And the reason for the sound of crickets, I think, is because this guy, this superhero that we all believe exists, actually doesn't exist. And who is this superhero? This, uh, this superhero is the business-minded person, the entrepreneur, who reads the educational research, who understands your findings, and takes them to heart, and goes out and uses them to improve and bless hundreds of thousands or millions of lives. That person is just not there. I thought if I was doing my work and learning the things I was supposed to learn and putting them in the... Uh, putting them out there in the literature, it was somebody else's responsibility to pick them up and carry them across the finish line. Um, Thirteen years into my career now, you know, I haven't seen that happen yet. And so, you know, I'm left asking myself questions like, well, that's one study where we worked with 30 students for one semester was really cool. Is that all the impact I really want to have? Am I going to wait for this non-existent superhero to come read all my articles and understand what they mean and go out and apply them to, to bless a bunch of other people's lives? Um, I found this on an exercise website. But I think it applies to us as well. 
you know, who knows your work as well as you do? Who's going to pick it up and carry it across the finish line to make sure that it actually impacts people's lives? Or in my case, who's going to pick up the work that I've been working on, the theoretical pieces of, you know, and go out and actually make it impact people's lives? You know, so this led me to look at social entrepreneurship. Right? Who are, if, if these entrepreneurs aren't going to come to me, you know, maybe I've got to meet them halfway. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with, I mean, there are all kinds of approaches to starting businesses. I've, I've really become enamored with this lean startup literature, uh, one of the key mantras of which is get out of the building. You can't actually learn anything. You can't actually help anyone sitting in the conference room talking to three other people just like you drawing on a whiteboard. You have to get out of the building and go talk to people and go actually try to help them and see when your help works and see when your help doesn't work and come back and try to make your help more helpful. Because uh, as one of the members of my committee when I was a graduate student who's now passed on said, help is only help when it's helpful. We think we do a lot of helping, but we actually only help when we're helpful. So over the last couple of years, I've been trying to get out of the building. Um, you know, so one of the things that we've tried to do is uh, we started this online virtual charter high school in Utah. And we said, you know, the, the role of charters is to go out and try things that are innovative or maybe crazy, depending on which side you look at them from. Go out and try these experiments and to the degree that they work and you learn things, roll them back in to the broader education system. So Mountain Heights Academy, which was originally called the Open High School of Utah, but recently expanded down into grades seven and eight, so it's not a high school anymore, and so it got renamed. It's another story. You know, this is an experiment in open educational resources. Could we open a charter school whose charter says you are forbidden from ever adopting commercial curriculum materials? You can only ever use open educational resources. I mean, clearly you can do that, but what would the impact be, right? Would nobody learn anything? Would people drop out? Would it be boring? Whatever. So this experiment is going really well. Last year on the state standardized test, take that for what you will, you know, it was the 30, it was ranked number 31 of all the high schools in Utah. Interesting experiment I'd love to talk more about, but I have five minutes left. You know, we built on the success of that experiment and went back to the state office and said, hey, these open educational resources are actually, you know, a pretty good deal. Not only do they not cost any money, uh, but it seems like students are actually learning quite a bit from using them. There's more that they can do with them. Maybe it would be great if we could take some of these and start to roll them back into brick and mortar classrooms. Well, you know, we don't have one-to-one -one initiatives really. Our kids don't have access to the technology they would need to access these online. Well, what if we did print on demand? Well, print on demand could work. So this is the physics textbook from this year. Um, you probably can't read it, but just under the, under the uh, cover there is the price. It's $4.49 in print for a high school physics textbook uh, that only contains exactly what we need it to contain in the state of Utah. In fact, the table of contents is the Utah State Science Core. Outcome one, page one. Outcome two, page 36. Outcome three. You start from just exactly the outcome that you want and need to cover. You aggregate open educational resources around those. There's no cruft. There's no stuff that was stuck in there for Florida or Rhode Island or somebody else. It's just what you need. It's $4.50. And uh, these data are two years old now. We'll st we're still working on this past year's data. But after using propensity score matching to create apples to apples comparisons between control and treatment groups, and after accounting for over a dozen factors, including whether students qualify for free and reduced lunch and other things, the students in classrooms using open textbooks scored higher on the state standardized tests than the students in the classrooms that weren't using open textbooks. So yes, we can save money. And yes, we can actually improve student learning a little bit. Even if we didn't improve student learning, even if it just came out even and we saved a bunch of money, that would be a win, right? So, you know, moving this work kind of further up the food chain into post-secondary, into community colleges and universities, you know, we've been developing this idea of the displacing adoption. 
So it's not an open educational resource. It's assigned as a supplement together with your $190 intro to psychology textbook. It's open educational resources that displace that so that on the syllabus, the required textbook cost is $0 because we're using open educational resources in place of that. Kaleidoscope Project was a next generation learning challenges funded project, still is actually. Um, started with uh, eight community college and university partners. It's now up to 23 and, and still growing, where we are taking a bunch of introductory classes, general education kind of courses, and developmental courses at the community college level, and moving those from textbooks exclusively over to OER. And we've seen some really incredible results. So this is from Mercy College, which is one of our partners in New York. This is for a uh, developmental math course that they teach their students trying to get up to speed enough in math that they can take the one college algebra course they need to earn their degree. And you can see that the pass rate, you know, over the th these three years, pass rate goes from 48% to 53% to 60% as they go from not using OER at all to having six sections that used OER to flipping all the sections of this course off of a commercial textbook and a Pearson product called My Math Lab where they go on to do interactive practice a bundle for which costs $170, two open textbooks, open videos, and an open source online interactive practice system, 12% uh, gain in students who are passing that course. And another really exciting thing, we just, this just started this fall, just opened, we've been working on it all year long, it's something we call Textbook Zero, which is like Open High School of Utah, but in the post-secondary space, right? So take an entire degree program and make it possible to graduate from that entire program solely using OER without ever having to buy a textbook. So the first program that rolled out, it just opened this fall a couple of months ago at Tidewater Community College in Virginia. This is their Associates of Business Administration. It's a two-year degree, $3,000 in tuition each year, plus another $3,000 in textbook costs. So by making this move, they cut the cost to graduate by a third for their students. So, you know, in terms of kind of getting outside the building and trying to have some impact beyond just those 30 students, you know, it gets kind of exciting. You think about, oh, 13,000 students and about $1.3 million saved in post-secondary. In secondary work, you know, the textbooks cost less and they get spread out over multiple years of the adoption cycle. So it's 35,000 students so far that have been Im impacted, but they've only saved about a quarter. The schools have saved about a quarter million dollars. That's pretty cool, but how do you get from 50,000 now, like, to 5 million? or to 50 million? How does this go beyond some cool project that gets done and then all the grant funding ends and we write up a nice report about it? Nobody ever hears of it again. I don't really know the answer to that question. Um, I do know nobody else is going to do it for me. Um, so I've been pulling together friends and new friends and old friends and you know, we've started this company called Lumen Learning which seemed like the appropriate thing to do to get something to scale up to like five million people probably needs a company to make that happen. Um, we're still trying to figure out exactly how all of that works. Um, but you know, in, in terms of the push yourself, because nobody else is going to do it for you, you know, I, I love this quote. We, it might be apocryphal. It's attributed to Hannibal when people told him he couldn't actually go over the Alps. He said, I will find a way or I will make one. Um, which I think kind of brings us back, you know, to, to these thoughts of we all have these superpowers, whether you're saving boys or working on the affordability of education or whatever problem it is that you are interested in, you do have these superpowers and they come with a high level of responsibility. And because nothing is impossible to you, it behooves you to think really hard and me to think really hard and be reflective about what am I doing with my superpowers. And, Am I Magneto or am I Professor X? Am I using my superpowers for some self-serving purpose that may or may not be destructive to others around me? Or am I using my superpowers to kind of you know, try to improve life and bless mankind? Um, you know, the knight in the third Indiana Jones movie told him to choose wisely. That turned out to be really good advice. Do you remember what happened to the other guy? Um, not that if you make a wrong choice, you'll turn into a pile of dust like he did. But my message to you is please consider the superpowers that you have. Consider the obligation that you have to use them in some way that builds up and improves society and then go out 
and do whatever that problem is you want to solve, whatever it is you want to work on, pick something meaningful and have a real go at it because nobody's going to do it for you. Thank you.